What's up, everybody? Welcome to the All Sooners podcast. You got us on a Wednesday today. It's January 10th. It's cold outside. This is episode 233. Uh, I think I messed up the number last week, but hey, I was flustered. I was under pressure, so uh, it happens from time to time. That's Ryan Chapman. He's in more. I'm John Hoover. I'm in Tulsa. Randall Sweet is back from his uh, return to San Antonio. He's been on the clock, you guys, since December 26th. So he's earned some time off. I gave him some time off. He got some time off. He'll be back on tomorrow, but we are podcasting today. So Randall, next week, buddy. Ryan and I, on the other hand, we've been coasting. Not doing anything. <laughs> I, I wish we had been coasting. Uh I, I'm a little worried. I, I don't think we've done, or I've had to do three whole uh, segments in a lot. I don't know. How, how does this all work? What what, uh, what do we do in the third segment? What is happening? Randall's actually got some good re- stuff recruiting-wise from San Antonio, but uh, I thought it more important that he give you uh, a refreshed Randall next week rather than, hey, man, get back home and jump on the podcast. I try not to crack the whip on you guys too much. I gave you Christmas Day off. You know, we reconvened in San Antonio on the 26th. So I'm not a big, uh, I'm not a big grinder. I'm not a big driver of, of, of uh, you know, like the cattle drives of the old days. We, I put them up, you know, ride them hard and put them up wet and all that stuff. I like when you guys are fresh. So here we go. We, uh, we, we appreciate staying fresh. Although uh, we'll talk about this to close the show. Porter Moser and his team doing the dang thing is not good for keeping me fresh when we go football into men's basketball into softball, but uh, those are first world problems. We are a month away from softball season opening day. A month? What? We'll get to all that basketball and softball later on in the show. Uh, But I want to refresh you guys on last week's podcast. Uh, We wrapped up the podcast. Literally, like, I've got lights right here. I've got lights back here. I've got lights over here. I've got light over here. I turned them all off. I picked up my phone because it makes it hot in here. Let's be honest. It gets hot and sweaty by the end of a podcast. I picked up my phone and it the message came in. Boom. Ted Roof, no longer defensive coordinator at Oklahoma. And I'm like, Ryan, let's add a segment to the podcast. So that's literally how fast it happened. I was sitting right here in this chair in front of this computer we, uh, we turned the lights back on and we podcasted about the departure of one Ted Roof. It was, it was interesting. Um, as, we, as we broke that down, you know, it was a very popular segment, obviously. It was like an emergency podcast, whatever. But that was, uh, that was last Thursday when we just happened to podcast on a Thursday. If we had podcasted on a Wednesday, we would have missed it. We would have probably had to do something emergency-wise Thursday. I don't know. But what we didn't see coming down the pike was that Brent Venables, if you look at his quote, and we talked about it last week, but if you look at his quote in the press release, he said, uh, I I, I decided to move in a different direction. I asked Ted to, to be reassigned to another position. He didn't want to. He wanted to keep coaching. Basically, he asked him to take a demotion, like an analyst job. Because why? Because Brent Venables had already made up his mind. He's going to hire the next guy. And that next guy, we found out literally just a few hours later, it was like four hours later, it was Zach Alley. Zach Alley was Brent's guy before Brent went to Ted Roof and said, Ted, I'd like you to take a, a step down. I'd like you to take a demotion. Some, some <laughs> He figured it out planning. well before he went to, to Ted Roof. I, the timing of that was obviously planned by Venables, and, and frankly, it's pretty impressive work. Yeah, and now in a weird way, the coaching search lasted – coaching search in bunny years – lasted four hours, but we're still waiting on an official announcement. Uh, I'm not yeah. expecting that to be anything other than dotting I's, crossing T's, all that stuff, but we've been in that mode since last Thursday. So mm-hmm. uh, that part of it has been weird, especially – I know that the Board of Regents can do an emergency meeting just to rubber stamp stuff whenever they need to, but the Board of Regents, I think they get together on Friday, to, which would be your typical um, where uh, everyone's retained, all that stuff, if that goes by. So you'd think it'd be a good spot to say, hey, any improvements to Seth Luttrell's contract, push that through. You got yep. um, Joe John's contract, push that through, and you can put Ali on the same docket, but uh, – Still waiting because as of twelve twenty-five here on this Wednesday, no official word from Oklahoma, though 
it, it's Zach out. Like he, he's the guy. Yeah, they're they're doing some. I was told they're doing, and this was um, Monday. Yeah, this was Monday. They're doing some HR stuff, and you know, basically the the school and the the Brent Brent put like I said, Brent hurried it through. It was a it was a week after the uh, the bowl game, so he he fast tracked that thing, and there may be processes in place for hiring you know, vetting and verifying and background checking and all that stuff that take time. I don't know that Brent adhered to that process. I don't know that he didn't, but I'm just saying, I don't know that he did. He may have gotten ahead of the process a little bit. And that's why we're sitting here a week later, almost yeah, seven days later, literally. And it's like, they still haven't announced anything. I think they're going through the process of running him through HR and doing background checks and Checking his browser history and all that crazy stuff, right? Uh, but we'll see. That would be something, wouldn't it? I mean, just how crazy would that be if they come back and say, sorry, we can't hire this guy? Yeah. That would be a black eye. That would be an embarrassment for the program. That, I'm just saying. It, it's not going to happen. Yeah. But if it did. It, it'd be stunning. And I think it's just that there's a football process that happens and the admin process. And uh, when you know it's your guy, the football process usually typically goes along a lot sooner. Because, like, yeah. why, why this wouldn't happen if you had gone through what would be a more – traditional search like say for brett venables like when, when we were going through the brett venables search uh, oklahoma can walk and chew gum at the same time as jokes at leon says hey i want to interview brett venables hey i want to interview guy b hey i want to interview guy c the admin can do all the background check stuff in the process while jokes at leon's talk with brett venables all that stuff i think it's just one of those things that brent almost arrived at it before like the, the football part of it moves faster than the admin part of it one, one of it bureaucracy red tape all that fun stuff yeah. Yeah, the HR hasn't uh, hasn't done their due diligence yet. Oh, who knows? Um, they probably have. You know what? The other side of the coin might be. Brent's agitated that everybody reported this when it when it broke last week. Um, we've got our own sources now telling us. Obviously, uh, it's been verified ad nauseum throughout the country. Uh, all the national guys, all the media sources, everybody has reported that this is happening. There's been interviews about from his colleagues about, yeah, he's going to do great at Oklahoma. So it's done, but Brent may be like, I'll show those guys. Let's, let's wait a week and just get under their skin a little bit. But I don't know. Just saying, what, what just are we odd. sitting here a week later for? It's just odd, but uh, it's weird. It's definitely weird. Since no panic or anything for what's going on, <clears throat> seems like it's just one of those things that, uh, Sometimes it takes a little time with uh, some of the stuff. And so we'll roll through that. I imagine, too, like what does the uh, coordinator framework look like? What, how do they want to yeah. officially split the duties, all the language, all that stuff? Uh, I, I would imagine from even like the – and this is just pure speculation, but from like the agent perspective, I think that Zach Alley was like, hell yeah, I'll go join Brent Venables in Oklahoma and, and yeah. link up with his, uh, you know, the, the protege, uh, you know, mentor relationship. Probably before anything was on like anyone's radar, so like the framework for like a contract, and it's like no one has any leverage anymore. It's just like, uh, well, I want to be here, and you want me here, and let's figure out. I, I don't know. Maybe that's part of it. Maybe it's HR. Who knows? It it, it just it reminds me of when I hired you. Yeah, I was just like, yes. Wait, sorry. Wait, am I supposed to hold out? No, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Negotiate. What's that? So Zach Alley uh, is a self-described Venables clone. Uh, he said he talks like him. He said he coaches like him. Um, he describes himself that way. So he was uh, for two years, the last two years, uh, including this season, defensive coordinator at Jacksonville State. Before that, he was a year at Louisiana Monroe. Guy's 30 years old. He just turned 30. He's a former Clemson student assistant and grad assistant. He was a high school football player. He didn't play college football. Went to Clemson to, to study under Dabo Swinney. And then the following year, they bring in Brent Venables. So uh, he's an interesting guy. Um, he's very young. He's very green. When they hired him at uh, Louisiana Monroe at the age of 20, I guess he was not quite 28 yet. Um, he was the youngest coordinator, defensive coordinator in the country. Huh? So very interesting. Now he's fast tracked to Oklahoma. I don't know if he's still the youngest defensive coordinator at 30 years old, um, but he's, he's way up there. <clears throat> Um, anyway, Ryan and I are both keeping our eyes on the phone, on the Twitter notifications and the email inbox because stuff always seems to break when we're on the podcast. So if that happens, we'll take a quick break and we'll do the story for you at all Sooners, have all the stuff popped up there. 
Ryan, let's just uh, let's just continue the vibe on uh, Zach Alley. Your thoughts on Brent Venables making the move first to tire fire Ted Roof, who who still had one year left on his contract, and then his move to bring in a thirty year old defensive coordinator. Yeah, I think it's really interesting from the psychology of like what Brent Venables is doing as far as Brent Venables the head coach because go all the way back to Big Twelve media days and Brent Venables was talking about you know for this team to be the best it needs to be I still need to be heavily involved in the defense right which led to a whole month or so of us speculating, like, is Brent Venables just going to be the defensive coordinator, just just call it himself, all that stuff. Yep. Um, and, and then you lead to, we, we talked about it when we did the emergency pod, which was the way that Brent Venables stated he wanted to go a different direction with the defensive coordinator, which led me to believe that he wanted someone that was actually going to like be a DC. And so Zach Galley makes a ton of sense in, in, in this realm. It's that, hey, he spent almost a decade once Brent Venables arrived at Clemson, working under Brent Venables directly to learn his system, learn how Brent Venables wants to do things, all that. And when you think about it, Ted Roof had one season of overlap as an analyst at Clemson before he came over and was promoted. So while Ted Roof had a one-year background, like Zach Alley, all he knows is this is how Brent Venables teaches things. This is his system. This is what Brent Venables believes defensively. This is how I need to teach things. And so it, it makes a ton of sense for Brent if he's going to come on in and say, okay, defense is my baby, and I need to be more of a head coach, more of a CEO. I'm still going to be involved with the game planning, all that stuff, to go to someone that he has worked with for years and years and years, who then immediately went out and made quite an impression at, with Brian Harson as a co-special teams coordinator and linebackers coach at Boise State for a couple of years. ULM, that defense makes huge improvements. And then what he did at Jacksonville State, I think is just incredibly impressive considering he came in at the same time that Jacksonville State's elevating up to the FBS level. So anything he's doing is basically with like a framework of FCS players than anything he can gra grab in the transfer portal recruiting wise. And so you look at what they did um, as far as making big leaps forward, where they were. If you're a if you're a stop rate person, if you like the advanced analytics, they were seventh or eighth in stop rate uh, per Max Olson. Uh, you look at scoring defense, they were uh, top fifty and all that stuff in their first season in the FBS. Now he's going to take that step up. It, it, it just feels like this is Brent Venables going and saying, "Who do I trust to run my defense? Mini me." I, I'm going to go find my mini me. And, and for Brent Venables, that is Zach Alley. We've seen this a lot, right? For so long, Alabama, Nick Saban, who did he trust? Kirby Smart. Kirby Smart ran everything. Then when Kirby got to Georgia, he trusted Mel Tucker. Then he trusted Dan Lanning. And, and I think that you've seen that that's something where if you want to talk about game management, running the sideline, penalties, all that stuff, by, by being able to take the step back and, and Brent Venables can insert himself where he's really needed, it should improve all those things because we talked about it last year. Uh, Brent Venables suddenly doesn't know, hey, you're supposed to use a timeout here, not use a timeout here. Like He's been around football for so long under such great coaches. I know he knows how to manage the game. I think uh -huh. he brought, may have just been doing too much himself on the sideline. Yeah, someone's always managed the game for him. Yeah, He's never had to manage the game. Now that he's the head coach, he's got to manage the game. That means he's got to do little things that he's never had to think of before that were his duty. Uh, you know, sure, coach, everybody knows you call timeout in that situation. Everybody knows you run to the sideline, you throw it away, you get down, you slide, you stay in bounds. He knows what to do. He's never had to delegate that before. He's uh, he's never had to be the guy who makes that call. Uh, fourth and uh, third and six, what do we do here? Because I'm not really sure my field goal kicker is accurate. I don't want to punt it down there and have it go in the end zone. Maybe we should go for it, you know, have two calls ready on third down. He's never had to do that before. Now he's got to do that. He's got to think like that. So standing over there with the defensive team, uh, screaming at somebody for not blitzing in the B-gap when he told them to blitz in the B-gap, that's not what a head coach does. Uh, just ask – it's right down the hallway, right? Just ask Bob Stoops, um, you know, about the defensive coaches uh, – about the head coach's responsibilities with the defense. Uh, at one point, I remember somebody telling a story recently. Stoops was getting ready to lay into somebody, and this was early 2000, 2001, something like that. And Mike Stoops was yelling at somebody, and Brent Venables was yelling at somebody, one of the players, and Bob was coming down there, and he stopped, and he saw them both giving it to the guy, and he said, we're good. I can." And he puts his headset on and goes and coaches the offense. That's how it's done. That's how you got to do it. So – 
good for good for Brant for recognizing that if that's what he does, if that's the way he goes. We don't know yet, but we anticipate that's what's going to happen. Here's the deal with um, with uh, Zach Alley. Here's the deal. Bad coaches. Sorry, I said it wrong. I tried to say it right the first time. Good coaches don't usually come from bad programs, right? Good coaches usually come from good programs. Good coaches usually learn from other good coaches. He's coached for Dabo. He's coached for Rich Rodriguez. He's coached for Terry Bowden. And he's coached for Brian Harson. That's 185, 181, 170, and, and, and 85 total victories. I use the calculator for this to be sure. 621 career wins in that foursome right there. 621. That's a lot of success. You can't help but learn. 25 conference championships, two national championships, two undefeated seasons. Ryan, this guy's known nothing but success. Yeah, it's it's in his pedigree, and it's kind of like <clears throat> Brent Venables, right? Comes to play <clears throat> under Bill Snyder. Then when he makes his first branch off, it's under Bob Stoops. And while that was kind of an unknown as a head coach, everyone knows how that turned out. And then he was one of the key cogs Brent Venables was in all of Dabo's success. And so he's hoping, I think, that he can replicate that a little bit with Zach Galley. And and uh, it's one of those things where, hey, after two years, I think that he has – he talked about it again. He, he didn't know what he didn't know coming into year two. And now I think he's got two years of experience, one where he – Felt like in year one, tried to be the CEO for some things, but was trying to, he was figuring out what is his capacity? What, how much can he handle on a week to week basis and have the team firing on, on all cylinders, all that stuff. It got a lot better, obviously in year two. And, and so now um, I have to believe that this is something that Brent Venables looked at and was going, Hey, I'm going to have a first year starting quarterback on the other side, stuff like that. I, I need to be present for whatever everything needs. And, and again, I think it just goes back to a trust thing of Ali's got a pedigree and it hasn't been watered down too defensively. He's run Brent Venable's system for the two years, one, one at ULM, one at Jacksonville State. And he wasn't with Brian Harson long enough for, if you want to say, pick up less than Brent Venable's habits or stuff like that. He, he wasn't there long enough to do that, right? Like why did Brian Harson hire him as a linebackers coach? I would imagine it's because he wanted Brent Venable's light to coach the linebackers. One of those things. And he probably wasn't meddling. Yeah. So Jacksonville State, uh, second year, um, I guess, under Rich Rod. I can't remember how many years he's been there. Has he been there three years? Anyway, uh, Allie was there two years. They went nine and four this season. So they he jumps in at Louisiana Monroe. The defense goes from like 110 to like 50-something, 40-something. I can't remember what, but it was a huge jump. Same thing with, um, with Jacksonville State. First year. They were the the year before he got there, it was really bad. Then the next year, it was like really decent, really good. They've improved ever since. Um, I think Ryan mentioned it: twenty one point two points per game. That's thirty second in the country. One hundred eleven rushing yards per game. That's fourteenth in the country. It's pretty good. Two hundred forty one passing yards per game. Not good. That's ninety fifth in the country. But their defense was a little like Oklahoma's this year. Couldn't stop the pass unless they were intercepting the football. They had 16 interceptions, which was ninth in the nation. Had 25 takeaways, which was eighth in the nation. They had 12. Uh, they were 12th in the country in quarterback sacks, 2.9 per game, 12th in the nation. 17th in the nation in tackles for loss, 7.1 per game. So you see a corollary there. It's a very, very simple comparison. Give up big passing yards but get interceptions, get tackles for loss, get off the field on third down. 22nd in the nation on third down defense, 32%. Uh, 33rd in the nation in pass efficiency defense, 123 rating. Their overall defensive ranking this this year, Jacksonville State was 42nd. So not elite by any stretch, but 130 teams, not bad. 353 yards a game. Now here's some analytics for you guys. You like analytics. Points per play. Jacksonville State was 22nd in the nation in points per play, all right, 0.29 or something like that. Yards per play, 4.7 yards per play by the defense. That's 13th in the country. And then the big one for a lot of, lot of coordinators and a lot of analytics guys these days is points per drive. How many points? This is akin to stop rate. 1.59 points per drive. That's 17th in the nation. 
OU was 29th this year. So pretty impressive stuff. They lost to Coastal Carolina. They lost to Liberty. Coastal had one of their best years ever. Liberty had their best year ever. South Carolina in the SEC. And then New Mexico State had their best year ever, pretty much. They lost to three schools that had their best year ever, pretty much, and uh, South Carolina. And in those four losses, they only allowed 3.2 yards per rush. So they still played their ass off on defense, even though they lost all four of those games. Pretty, uh, like I said before, pretty impressive stuff by Zach Alley. Yeah, and so it'll be interesting, too, because he's going to have a veteran core already that he'll inherit defensively uh, as far as just – Every single, like the basically every single person who had to make a decision on the defense, it sounds like it's coming back. I mean, that's the easiest way to uh, to summarize that. And so he'll have a veteran core to work with. He'll have a bunch of talent. He'll have some young talent coming in. Uh, no reason why he shouldn't be able to. It, again, it, it's Brett Venable's handpicked guy to come in and run the defense. I'm just fascinated to get that officially announced, get to talk to him, and get to be feel out. You're calling all the plays, right? Stuff like that. Yeah, we'll see. He's going to say that that's well, – we'll see. We'll see how it works. We'll see what B, Coach V's plan is. He calls him Coach V. Um, Coach V told us two years ago he – was it – I guess – God, I'm having trouble remembering when he said this. I run. I was running the defensive meetings. It was National Signing Day last year, so he was talking about rec- a recruiting date during the 22, yeah, the 22 season uh, when he was running the defensive meetings. Um, head coach doesn't need to be running the defensive meetings. Roof told us that he makes the calls on game day, but Brent Venables interjects whenever he wants to do something, say something, change something, alter something, whatever. This job, man, it's OU football. It's too big for the head coach to be the defensive coordinator. Lincoln Riley was an elite, right, offensive coordinator. When he became the head coach, he learned really quick, wow, this is a lot. Uh, but he hired a defensive head coach and Alex Grinch and let turn the defense over to him completely so he could keep his fingers on the offense. I think everybody was okay with that. Don't you get the feeling that everybody's like, yeah, Lincoln Riley could be the offensive coordinator and the head coach. I think a lot of people wanted him to hire an offensive coordinator, but I think for the most part, fan base was pretty okay with him being the OC and the head coach because there was a defensive coordinator already in place. I don't get the feeling that they're okay with Brent Venables being the head coach and the defensive coordinator, right? It's, it's for some reason there's like a double standard. It feels different. Well, it, it's always though like you look at it, and defensive coordinators are usually like on the whiteboard making adjustments. And Brent Venables, there were times that he was on the whiteboard during timeouts in year one. I don't remember seeing it in year two. Lincoln was never that. He he never was was that no. as a head coach. He would make his adjustments as he was talking with uh, the quarterback, whether it be Baker coming off the field or Kyler coming off the field, and then he would hand all that stuff off, and you would see Bill Bedenboe. Uh, DeMarco Murray, Kale Gundy, whoever is around. I guess you wouldn't see Kale. He was up in the box. But th- those guys were on the sideline doing everything. And if he was making adjustments, he was just doing it totally in his head, talking on the headset. And he was still watching and engaged with what was happening. There are times where Brent Venables early in drives offensively is turned around talking to guy. You know what I mean? So uh, I think yeah. it's just a little bit different. And it, it's something that uh, every head coach kind of goes through. And it's just weird because in college football, there are a ton of offensive head coaches that still call plays. But like, I don't see Dan Lanning calling plays at Oregon, yeah. stuff like that. For whatever reason, it, it's just uh, not how things roll for the defensive head coaches. You know something else, too. If Brent Venables in his first couple of seasons had uh, a couple of Nagurski winners, right, and had the number one ranked defense or the number two ranked defense in the country, I don't think anybody would be complaining about anything, right? Yeah. But they didn't have those award winners. They didn't have the number one defense or a top 20 defense or a top 50 defense. So you look at the head coach and go, what are you doing over here? You're the, you're the defensive coordinator. That's not working. You're the head coach too. Get over here and be the head coach. That's what people want. That's what the fan base wants. I know I'm boiling this down too much and oversimplifying, and, and it's going to be a very – complex and involved process to get these guys uh, where Brent wants them and doing what he wants them to do. But I'll tell you this, the SEC is not going to care if Brent Venables is too busy to be the head coach or if the defensive coordinator is in over his head. The the SEC is a pack of ravening wolves and they're going to take down whoever's in their way, whether they're full strength or know what they're doing or don't. The SEC is real. Yeah, it, it'll be interesting. It's a huge move. It's it's a huge decision by Brent Venables, but uh, Oklahoma's got to take another huge step forward defensively this year. We just saw in the national championship game, 
Jackson Arnold, if he takes care of the ball, he doesn't have to be elite for you to get to where you want to be in college football. I don't think anyone confused Stetson Bennett for being elite in anything like that. And he did two of those national championships. Got to have a defense, though. And Oklahoma's got to find a way to take another step forward, build off the success they had this year, fix the pass defense, get more active in the pass rush. All that stuff is stuff that has to happen. And I think Brent Venables knows that. So I, I think you're seeing him move to a guy that he's like, he knows my system in and out. He can teach my system in and out more than just two years on the job. One of those things. I mean, if you take Ali's two years that he's been calling defense himself, plus all the time he spent at Clemson, he still, still spent way more time than Ted Roof did learning Brent Middle's system. It, it's just a, a comfort thing, I have to believe. Yeah, that's. I think that's well said. Tell you what, uh, transfer portal comings and goings, who's here, who's where, uh, all that's coming up next on the All Sooners podcast.